From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Uh, Johnny Dollar. Mitchell Dollar. Oh, swell. Take some warm milk. You'll be asleep in an hour. I'm sorry to wake you up, but this is important. Okay. How fast can you get to New York? Pretty fast. If you let me get out of bed and slip on some clothes, I might make it in a couple of hours. Well, it's 5.30. Get to the New York office by the time it opens. Unless I get a 40-mile tailwind, you're going to be an awful liar. What's this all about? A double indemnity. A man named Farmer burned to death. He has a wife. She gets $100,000 unless... She likes fires. Okay. I'll get out of bed. Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the George Farmer matter. Expense account item one, $5.80 for gas and a cup of coffee between Hartford and your New York office. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Mitchell called me this morning, 5 o'clock, said you'd be here. He called me at 5.30. He must have been very sure you'd take the job. (laughs) He's familiar with my bank account. Here are the briefs on the case. Uh, Mr. Farmer was on his vacation to the Catskills, a place called the Sportsman's Retreat. Uh Uh-huh. This is the correct address on the wife? Yes. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Who? Oh, put him on. Yes, hello, Dr. Evans. Yes. Farmer? George Farmer? Yes, that's right. Our investigator's here now. All right, I'll have him come right over. Sir. This is Dr. William Evans, one of our insurance doctors. He says he has some information on the farmer case. Oh, he was the one that okayed Farmer for the policy. He's in the equitable building. You better go on over. He says it's rather important. Expense account item two, a dollar for cab fare and tip to the equitable building. You may ask why I didn't use my car, in which case I may ask if you've ever been absurd enough to wheel your own car through early morning New York traffic. As my cab pulled up at the entrance of the equitable building, I spotted a large crowd, several police cars, and an ambulance. All right, just keep it back. Okay, you. Where do you think you're going? What happened? Some guy jumped eight floors. A Dr. Evans? I don't know. What makes you think it was this doctor? I haven't had an easy case in two years. What did you bet? His name's Evans. Hey, Jake, any identification? Yeah. Some doctor works the building. Name's Evans. Uh, be glad you're not a betting man, Sergeant. Wait just a minute, Joe. Sure. Hey, Jake, come here. Where is it? This guy knew who the guy was who jumped. Yeah? Knew who it was before he ever saw him. Didn't even know the guy had jumped till I told him. And he just up and bet me it was this Dr. Oh, yeah. Evans. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. I think you better come up and see a lieutenant. I think I better, too. <laughs> Jake followed me into the building and took me up to the eighth floor where I met Lieutenant William Briggs, a nice guy who worked for homicide and had done me a few favors in the past. Hi, Dollar. Hello, Bill. You know this guy, Lieutenant? Yeah, why? Where'd you find him? He knew the guy who jumped. I made a guess. Evans called my office on an insurance matter. Who pushed him? What makes you think he was pushed? Why well, call me, then take an eight-floor dive? I don't know. You got any ideas? Anybody see him jump? A couple of people who came out of the window feet first. They didn't see anybody give them a hand. Well, let me know if you find anybody who might have, huh? I'd appreciate the information. I'd appreciate some, too. Expense account item three, a dollar fifty for another cab to the home of Mrs. George Farmer. On the way over, I tried to put the first pieces together. A man named Farmer burned to death. A doctor named Evans had examined him and had some information. Evans winds up dead on the sidewalk. Answer, maybe Mrs. Farmer had it. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. It's going to be another hot day. I think everybody should have air conditioning, don't you? Definitely. Just make yourself comfortable. Can I get you something cold? Oh, no, thank you. I, I'd like to ask you some questions, Mrs. Farmer. About my husband's death? Yes, I've already talked to Mr. Arthur from your office, and I've told the police everything I know. Do you know uh, Dr. Evans? Dr. Evans? 
No. No, I don't know any Dr. Redmond. Your husband never mentioned him. No. What's he got to do with my husband? He examined him for his policy. Do you know who sold your husband his policy? I thought you were from the company. Late hunch. Thought you might save me the trouble of checking. No, I don't remember who sold him the policy. All right, Mrs. Farmer, thank you very much. Is that all? Yes, Mrs. Farmer, that's all for now. Expense account item four, $1.15 for another cab, back to the offices of Great Eastern Insurance, where I looked up the name of the agent who sold Farmer his policy. He was Martin Ames, and he lived on the east side. Item five, 10 cents by subway to the east side. Not conscience-stricken, just tired of cabs. Yes, what is it? I'm looking for Martin Ames. <laughs> hey, hey, take it easy. What's wrong? I'm Mrs. Ames. I was just on my way to the hospital. Martin's been in an automobile accident. <laughs> Expense account item six, eight dollars for a cab, fast and necessary. Three dollars for the necessary, five for the tip to make it fast. Nurse? Yes? I'm Mrs. Ames. I was told my husband... Oh, yes, Mrs. Ames, if you'll just have a seat. Well, who's in charge of the case? Dr. Gerson. I'll call him. But I want to see my husband. Can't I see him? You'll have to see Dr. Gerson first. But I want to know how serious it is. I should be with my husband if it's oh, serious. If you'll just be patient for a moment, I'll get Dr. Tully. Come on, Mrs. Ames. <laughs> Let's sit down over here. Come on. <laughs> now, just try and take it easy. Everything is going to be all right. Believe Dr. Me. Gerson, third floor reception. Dr. Gerson, third floor reception, please. Hello, darling. Ah, hello, Bill. Dr. Gerson. No, this is Lieutenant Briggs, Mrs. Ames. A police officer? Just a friend. Nothing about my husband. No, Dr. Gerson's the man you want to see. Now, can I talk with you, darling? Yeah, sure. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Ames? Of course. You'll be all right? I'll be all right. Okay, Lieutenant. This is far enough. About her husband? Yeah. Died five minutes ago. Yeah. Accident? No, uh, hit and run. Before he died, he told us a car ran him off the road. He went down a 20-foot embankment and right into a cement retaining wall. The wall stopped him from going any further, but it broke his neck. Any lead on the other car? A uh, lonely stretch of road. No one else saw it, and it happened too fast for Ames to see much. One of your company salesmen, wasn't he? Yeah. Oh, there's Dr. Gerson. I don't envy him. Oh, no. Oh, dear God, no. Come on, Briggs. This is turning into a rotten mess. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Farmer. This is Lieutenant Briggs. More questions? Afraid so. Come in. Sit down. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Farmer, two men have been killed today. Both of them knew your husband. What are you getting at, Lieutenant? I'm not sure. Where were you at the time of your husband's death? Right here. Right in this apartment. Why didn't you go with him to the Catskills? Because I didn't feel like it this year. He's been going to the Catskills every year for the past 15 years, and I was getting tired of it. Are you trying to imply that my husband's death was not an accident? Uh, we're just trying to find out why two men were killed. What have these two men got to do with my husband? Who are they? One was the doctor I mentioned this morning. I told you I never heard of him. The other was the insurance man who sold your husband his policy. I don't know anything about him. I never met him. Your husband started the fire by smoking in bed and then falling asleep. I guess so. How would I know? Was he in the habit of doing that? Oh, we've done it once or twice over a period of 15 years. Mr. Dollar, it seems to me your company is trying its best to get out of paying the money that's due to me. We're always allowed a certain time for an investigation. A representative from your company went up to the lodge and made an investigation. What more do you want? Uh, you were here in town at the time of your husband's death. Yes, and I can prove it. Now, if you have any further questions, I suggest you take them up with my attorney. I'm sick and tired of this whole thing. You've had absolutely no consideration for me. My husband is dead, and you persist in foolish, tiring questions. Now, please leave. I, 
I can't stand much more. All right, Mrs. Farmer. They don't bother showing us to the door. I'm entitled to that money, Mr. Dollar. I hope it won't be necessary to take legal action. Oh. Want to take a run up to Sportsman's Retreat, Lieutenant? Why? I'm just interested in knowing how Mrs. Farmer knew one of our investigators had already been up there. <laughs> We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. A brilliant orchestra leader and a rising young singing star will be found at CBS, the star's address, starting tomorrow. Guy Lombardo and his famous orchestra are taking the place of Jack Benny, and Mario Lanza, the sensational tenor of records and films, will be heard on most of these same stations in place of Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Be listening for their programs every Sunday, won't you? Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Briggs and I climbed into the squad car and started the long drive for the Catskills. Around 7 in the morning, we turned off the main highway and onto a dirt road. A sign reading, Sportsman's Retreat, two miles, pointed the way. And 20 minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the main lodge. Oh, I got a stiff neck. Mm. Man coming out of the line. Yeah, morning, 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 Good morning. morning. Well, I suppose you could... Oh... Police car. Huh? Yeah, I'm Lieutenant Briggs. This is Mr. Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Howdy. Are you up here about Mr. Farmer's death? Yeah, unofficially. You run the place? Well, do you ask? I'm the foreman. The name's Pop. Pop Sloan. Everybody just calls me Pop. We thought we'd stay a while, Pop. Can you put us up? Why, can I? Why, sure. How long do you feel on being around? Uh, not, not long. Well, come on in. Come in. Come in. Breakfast was an hour ago. If you're hungry, I can have the cook rustle up some old salad, bacon, and eggs. Oh, that sounds good. Any people staying here, Pop? Oh, about uh, 14. Uh, 14. The same crowd comes up every year. It's sort of a club, you might call it. How many years did George Farmer come up? Oh, about the last 12, 15 years, I guess. Who owns the place? Why, uh, Mr. Cam, uh, Phillips, he ain't here now. He phoned and said he'd be in some time this afternoon. Say, how how come you fellas are interested in Mr. Farmer's death? We had the sheriff investigate some insurance fellow was up here for three days. You're a little late, ain't you? Well, there uh, are a few things we haven't cleared up, Pop. Sure appreciate some help. Well, yeah, I'll give you all the help I can. I'll go get some breakfast for you, and then we can gab a while. Pop went back to the kitchen and we relaxed in a couple of big leather chairs in front of a large window that looked out on a row of cabins. Well, that last cabin must have been farmers. Yeah, nothing much left of it. Beautiful up here, isn't it, Johnny? Look at those trees with the sun shining through them. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah? Your soul is showing. It was beautiful, all right. The cabin stood in a clearing, fronted by well-kept pads and backed by tall trees. Pop came in with enough bacon and eggs to feed a platoon of tapeworms, and we talked. Hey, where is everybody, Pop? Oh, they're out fishing. We get up about four. It's about 4.30 around here. Many of the men bring their wives? Bring their wives away. Well, some of them. The farmer used to bring his up every year. He was the most beautiful, fine-looking woman, Mrs. Farmer. She didn't come up this year, though. Too bad, too. Oh, really? Why? Why? Why might have saved him? Maybe she'd have been here. She might have caught him with a cigarette before he went to sleep. Well, who, who discovered the fire? Who did? Well, we all saw it, but it was too late. By the time we got there, the whole place was burning. By the time we got the water, the hoses going, there wasn't much left. You say you all saw it? Where were you? Where were we? Why we was up the Willow Peak cooking out. It's about for. Uh, three miles from camp. See it right from here. You see it, uh, that tall peak there to the left. Of, no, I got a left of those trees. Yeah, yeah. How come Farmer didn't go along? Oh, he, I don't know, he never went on many hikes. He had trouble with his legs. Anyone stay here in the camp besides Farmer? No. Everybody was up at Willow Peak. Who examined the body? Why, well, Doc uh, Combs from Everson come up and looked at the body. Where is Evanston? 
Well, Davison is about uh, 50 miles east. But if you want to talk to the doc, you'll have to wait until he comes in for fishing. He's up here now. Yeah, he came up last night. He's going to stay a week with a patient. Huh? Why, well, good morning, Mr. C- uh, Phillips. Uh, didn't you expect you to this afternoon? This is Mr. Phillips, the owner. How are you? Hello. Hello. Some more police fellows, Mr. Phillips. Oh, about Mr. Thomas there? Johnny Dollar. Yeah, I'm an insurance investigator. This is Lieutenant Briggs. He's the policeman. Well, I thought you both... I've got some bags in the car, Pop. Would you get them, please? Would you get them? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, We just want to ask a couple of questions, Mr. Phillips. Oh, I thought the authorities were satisfied. Where were you when the accident occurred, Mr. Phillips? Well, I was on my way here from the city. I arrived about an hour later. You live in the city? I have a house there. I divide my time between there and the lot. Now, tell us something about Farmer, Mr. Phillips. What kind of a man was he? You fellas want any more breakfast? No, no thanks, Pop. Go ahead, Mr. Phillips. Well, there uh, really isn't much to tell. Farmer was a nice sort of guy, quiet. Do you have any trouble with him smoking in bed before? Several times. Nearly started the fire two years ago. Wouldn't that make you watch him a little more closely? His wife came up with him every year, but this one, she was usually near enough to prevent any trouble. Isn't your company satisfied, Mr. Dollar? Routine. How long did Farmer usually stay here? Oh, a week, ten days. However long his vacation lasted. He was in the advertising business, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe so. How much did it cost him to come up here every year? Oh, anywhere from two to three hundred. He was tight as the devil, known for it. This was the only luxury he allowed himself. He told everyone he'd save all year just to come up here and relax hey, for the week. Hey, Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar, here comes Doc Holmes. Limit. You interested in talking to the doctor? Yeah, Pop tells us he was the one who examined the body. Ah, what did you get, Doc? Uh, Pop, not my limit. Well, good for you. Come on over here. I want to talk to you. Well, how are you, Phil? Pop said you weren't due in until this afternoon. I'm fine, Doc. This is Lieutenant Briggs and Mr. Dollar. How are you, Doctor? You? Police? Uh, him. The other's an insurance investigator. I want to ask you a few questions. Is that it? Get up a few things about George Farmer getting burned to death. All right, thanks, Pop. What have you? Hey, How about having a cook clean up those fish, Pop? The fish? Well, all right, sure. I don't think I could tell you much more than I've already told the sheriff. Did you know George Farmer prior to his death? Yes, over a period of uh, ten years. Did you identify the body? Well, not at first. It was pretty badly burned. Not at first. Well, how were you able to identify it later? Well, when they told me that George had a broken wrist, I found the broken section of bone and identified it. Broken wrist? Uh, Yes, Mr. Dollar. When George arrived, his lower arm was in a cast. He told us that he'd uh, broken his wrist the week before. What day did he arrive? Uh, Tuesday of last week. Which wrist was broken? The right one. Would you say he could move his fingers well enough to write? Depends on how recent the accident. What are you getting at, Dollar? Do either of you know where Farmer had his wrist treated? No. Dollar, would you mind letting me know? Riggs... Can you call the precinct and have a man check and find out where Farmer had that wrist treated? Sure, but I don't see why... George Farmer had to sign that insurance policy, didn't he? Well, he could have done it with his left hand. Go find out when he broke that wrist, and I think I can show you that George Farmer was murdered. Murdered? We all waited while Briggs put in a call to his precinct and sent a man out to check on where George Farmer had his wrist treated. Around noon, the call came in. George Farmer broke his wrist on the 26th of last month. That tears it. Was treated at the Olive Hospital three weeks ago. Stayed one night at the hospital and went home. What date did he arrive here, Mr. Phillips? About the 4th. Two weeks after the accident. He died on the 11th. That's right. Been here about a week. Dollar, would you mind telling me just what you're driving at? The insurance policy went into effect the 22nd of last month. The first claim on George Farmer's policy was the double indemnity clause, not an accident claim for a broken wrist. Come on, Briggs. Let's go back to town. Talk to Mrs. Farmer. All right, what is it this time? We'd better talk about it inside. I promise you, Mr. Dollar, if you continue... We're coming in. Why? Well, all right. We think your husband was murdered. Murdered? That's ridiculous. We feel that you were an accomplice, Mrs. Farmer. Are you serious? Very. We just had the lab make a check on the insurance policy. The signature and the fingerprints were from the right hand. Of course they were. So your husband didn't have a broken wrist at the time? No, we did that sometime later. 
Would you swear it's his signature on the policy? Of course it's his signature. I went to the doctor with him. I thought you said you didn't know Dr. Evans. I don't. He was the insurance doctor. Well, I'd never seen him before or since. How could you expect me to remember Your husband didn't turn in a claim for his broken wrist? That was his business, wasn't it? Don't you think it's rather strange to take out an accident policy and not turn in a claim on your first accident? I don't know. I didn't bother with my husband's affairs. Is this your husband's driver's license? Yes. Where did you get that? Motor vehicle department. The signature on his license is not the same as the one on the insurance policy. What do you mean? He means that the signature on the policy is a very clever forgery. Who forged it, Mrs. Farmer? I don't know what you're talking about. Who went to that doctor's office representing your husband? No one. Why in the world would anyone do that? Why would someone represent my husband? For a $100,000 insurance claim. That's awful. Get out of here. That's not true. I'll sue you for saying that. Your husband wouldn't take out a large policy on himself. So with someone's help... You took one out for him and planned his death. Who was in on it with you? Who killed your husband up at the lodge? Get out! Get out! It had to be someone at the lodge who knew what cabin he was in. No, 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 no! The insurance salesman and the doctor were both killed because they could identify the man who took out the policy as not being your husband. No! Your husband was going to take this trip, so you planned his death and stayed home for an alibi. A man killed the doctor and the insurance agent. Someone strong enough to run a car off the road and lift an unconscious man out of a window feet first. Who killed him, Mrs. Farmer? I did. Bill! Good evening, Mr. Phillips. Why did you come out? Why didn't you stay in the other room? They'd have worn you down sooner or later. The car's in the back. Hurry up. You did some fast driving. Left the lodge right after you did. Go on, Lona. All right. Stay right where you are, Mrs. Farmer. I don't think you're in any position to be giving orders, Lieutenant. Sure he is. We expected you. Told you where we were going. Gave you enough time to get here. And what are you going to do about it? Take you. Bill! Forgetting my gun. You're forgetting ours. Think you can shoot both of us before we get get them out? I can try. Then try. Bill, no! Get out of the way! Dollar? Okay. Just a little scared. Girl's hit. Phillips is pretty dead. Mrs. Farmer? Uh, yes. I got an ambulance. You want to tell me about it? Oh, all right. Don't make any difference now. Phillips killed your husband and the other two men? Yeah. We fell in love three summers ago. But he planned it. The whole thing was his idea. Sure, I know. The state is pretty narrow-minded about those things, honey. A guy like that gets ideas and gets dead for it. If you like his ideas, you just have to get into some kind of trouble along the way. Expense account item six, eleven dollars, dinner for two. The good Lieutenant Briggs deserved all the stroke in our P8. Item seven, five dollars and ten cents for gas back to Hartford. Expense account total, thirty-three dollars and sixty-five cents. Remarks? Mrs. Farmer will probably get second degree for complicity. Great Eastern can cancel payment in accordance with the specifications set forth in said policy. Additional item, twelve hours good solid sleep for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, John McIntyre, Herb Butterfield, Harry Lang, Jeanette Nolan, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dick Cutting inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's the case of the uninvited guest that will bring you true police adventures on Gangbusters this evening. Your narrator will be San Francisco's police chief. Gangbusters is heard every Saturday on most of these same CBS stations. Stay tuned now for five minutes of the latest news, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde Sunday as the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>